Or is it Mermaid Filet? Uh, it's Mermaid Filet or Mermaid Filet. People have said different things. I. No, no, this conversation ends. Okay. No, 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 no. <laughs> 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 He's more nervous than me. That's hilarious. <laughs> I know. I don't know why this happens. Um, welcome to Zania for Games and Geekery. I am John Keevy and I'm here with uh, Mia Ardern. Mia, how are you doing? I'm all right. I'm all right. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm sorry we had like the giggle fits uh, a moment before we started rolling. That was silly of me. <laughs> I shouldn't have said anything nervous and and not funny. That's okay. I live in my nerves. Okay. So uh, we have you here because you have written this uh, new book called Mermaid Filet. Filet? Mermaid Filet, Mermaid Filet, however you want to say however it. However I want to say it. It's okay with me. Okay. That's perfectly good. Um, fine, I will mess it up. I have a very bad relationship with the French language. Um, yeah. What's up with that? Why do they not pronounce all the letters? I don't know. I don't yeah. know. I don't know. French is impossible. Okay. Why? Um, not why. What is the book about? Not why is it about. What is it about? The book is about smuggling mermaids in a black market um, empire. So they are these characters and they're all kind of involved with trading mermaid Um <clears throat> And that's like the basic premise. There's also a goddess who rains down menstrual blood when there's acts of sexual violence. Um, but basically it follows the lives of these six characters and by the end the reader discovers who really is the brains behind the operation. Okay. Right. Yeah, that's like the, the big revelation at the end. Mm -hmm. um, because I found it quite interesting that there is almost this um, mission that's given in the beginning um, that seems quite like, why is that a, a thing? And then it all kind of ties back um, towards the end. Is there a, like a larger theme at play um, with that? Hmm. I think maybe not a theme, but in terms of genre, like I like that noir whodunit formula. Like I like things to resolve. So that's what I wanted to do because why am I reading this huge book if there is like no, and any book for me is like a, it's an investment to read. So I like the idea of things tying up at the end. So it is something that I wanted to be able to do. And so, yeah, I think I would just speak to this idea of going on a quest and then having something revealed at the end of that quest. I like that familiarity. For me. It's, it's, it's just like a nice feeling. Okay, and where did the idea for the book come from? Um, I guess many different places. Um, the book's kind of set in the northern suburbs, so a lot of the characters and a lot of what, what you find in the book comes from uh, the places that I grew up in. Um, so it's set in like Babel South, Balha, uh, Kales River, um, and so the characters kind of came from those areas and people that I know from and uh, kind of scenes that are familiar to me. So that's what sparked a lot of a lot of what's in the book. The idea of the book, like of the ending of the, the premise didn't really come to me until I was busy writing it. So I didn't really know the ending until I was halfway through it. You've also worked as like a, a journalist um, and an opinion writer and a columnist. I've looked at like a lot of your like material and there's a very, very strong correlation between the stuff you write about um, uh, in that capacity and the themes of the book. Um, mm -hmm. How did that kind of like feed back and forth to each other? I think it helped a lot because I wrote for like Marie Claire and Cosmopolitan. I've done a few columns for Mail and Guardian. And so what I did have was like I'm used to putting my writing out there and having people think it's cuck or having people think it's great or having this constant feedback loop and like, you know, I was able to develop a bit of a thicker skin, which you need, I think, when you write. So uh, that it kind of gave me that audience um, relationship. So I think it played, it played a big part. And also the, the topics that I covered, I covered things like mental illness and um, feminism and identity issues and race politics and a lot of that stuff was, um, they, they were topics I'd have to write about, it was Mary Claire specifically. Um, and so often those were, they are nuanced issues, like even covering R. Kelly, for example, you have to do that in a pretty nuanced kind of way, even if it's in a six point listicle. And so I learned through those, through writing columns, kind of how to make things digestible without losing nuance, which I think is, is something that does require practice. One of the things I most admire about the book is like how nuanced and like it feels like often you really capture a truth about a lot of the characters, you know, that it feels like incredibly authentic, um, despite all this fantastical things, these fantastical things happening. Um, what's the process of kind of balancing realism and the fantastic? How does the fantastic mm -hmm. get into a work and it still speaks to reality? 
Um, I think there's something quite natural about it because life is fucking absurd. So, you know, having moments of like strong, almost hyper-realism, just almost they lend themselves to the absurd quite easily. So my, my book is written largely in cups. There are scenes that like it's written the way that people speak, um, but there's also completely impossible shit like, like you know, lips splicing together and characters not being able to speak, um, following like a sense of anxiety. So I think by exploring realism, it's, it's almost easier to go into surrealism, magical realism, if you're like very true to a reality, because reality, if you look at it carefully enough, is just like an overblown thing, like, or for me, it is anyway, like, when I look at reality, I feel very overwhelmed, so these things will play out in my mind, like, like my, I have a love bite, a scene with a love bite, which starts expanding, like, that's a kind of irrationality, and like a, a, a simple thing that can trigger, like, just, you know, overblown anxiety, and so it's just generally the way I approach the world, like, which is just to make everything bigger than Yeah, I kind of see, like, there's, like, some parallels in, like, like, Donald Glover's, like, Atlanta, Love Atlanta. You know, yeah, and, I'm, I, and uh, you kind of see a lot of this uh, like absurdism and fantasy kind of mm. coming in in, in more and more, um, I think, uh, mainstream works uh, mm. just to deal with like that the world is absurd and messed up, like you're saying. Right, you know? right. Yeah, I love yeah. Atlanta. Fuck, I love Atlanta so much. Yeah, and it's similar with with like shows like um, Bojack Horseman. I adore Bojack Horseman as well, um, and it also it also does does that just in really clever ways that don't feel like stretched from reality at all. But obviously, like, it is completely removed from reality in many ways, but it, like so, so relatable. And the scenes and, the, and the, the way these characters move through the world are very real. Um, so I think it's, you know, it can be done in really interesting, in really interesting ways in Atlanta, Bojo Cosmo, Rick and Morty as well. They are like examples that, of the love Adventure Time as well. Love that show. So I think it's we've seen it being done, and I think it's being done more and more because reality is just so fucking absurd. I guess it's it's the, the classic idea that if like the emotional truth is there, then like the metaphoric uh, and uh, and the the rest of reality can be like played with. For sure. You know, as long as people are real, the, like the truth of the people. Yes. Yeah. yeah it's like so, some famous motherfucker said that truth has nothing to do with fiction. No, fiction has nothing to do with truth. Or truth has nothing to do with fuck. Never mind. I've completely <laughs> lost the code of what I to go we'll, for. We'll like edit it in like at the end. We'll just like put put, put in a bubble at the bottom. <laughs> okay. Some famous motherfucker. <laughs> some famous motherfucker. <laughs> oh shit. Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you, working in um, genres uh, specifically um, because like. Boldly on the front of the cover, it says, mm. like, a, a noir crime novel. Mm. Um, like, I found it so, like, character-driven. I kind of found it, like, more relatable to something, um, like... Um, and I kind of found it more relatable to something like train spotting. you know? Like, where crime isn't, like, the point of it. Crime is, like, the backdrop. It's the character that's the real, like... Mm. That's the real juice of it. Um, and you... And your 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 writing is um, it's omniscient third person, but it's very very like within the character's point of view. Um, how do you get into so many different characters' heads? Mm, Sorry, that question like like went on a whole detour and then like came that's back. That's cool. <laughs> that's because uh, I have a, I have many people inside me. Like okay, I'm a, I've I've like very different moods that take on some of these characters, so they were quite easy to dip in and out of, and because they are they have different. I foregrounded different character traits, like you, you know, my one character has depression, I circle with depression. Other character has trauma, I circle with trauma. Um, and so it was easy to kind of access those, those things through these external characters. Um, crime does very much feature as a, as a backdrop. Like it's, I wouldn't say it's a crime fiction novel um, because it just, it just is a backdrop to what's going on. Um, I like that you use train spotting as an example. And I, I do kind of draw on those noir films. Like I love Tarantino um, and I love Guy Ritchie films. So I, I like that, ki that kind of pace, you know, and that the internal world of these characters is really what's being foregrounded while there's complete chaos going on in the background. And the thing is with organized crime, it really isn't that chaotic. It's pretty organized. It's just a totally normal business operating underground. Um, and so, you know, there's a lot of sense that that, like there's in a lot of ways it is just a normal it's just normal like day life um 
I know that I forgot what the question was. I think that also <laughs> makes perfect sense. Like the moments of violence are quite sudden and like incredibly, uh, at, at times incredibly brutal. And then at times incredibly just like, oh, this happened. Um, there's quite a stark contrast there. Um, I was like, I've forgotten what I was <laughs> That sometimes happens. Like, look at the wall. Dude. Look at the wall. Look at the wall. Yeah. I mean, like, that sometimes also happens. Like, when you just, like, you want to, like, talk about a thing and you're like, oh, actually, I didn't have a question. I just wanted to give you my opinion of, Which you of must your do. book. That's fine. Give you my <laughs> <laughs> oh, very, very naughty of me. I'm so sorry. Um, I, can, I can switch roles and just ask you questions. It's fine. Okay. okay. What about the book? Sure, but it's about the uh, no, I, I remember. I remember. Like, sorry, it, it was like I wanted to circle back to a point because uh, okay. there was a very good thing that, like, I was reacting to. Is uh, you were talking about the the traits of the characters being kind of you're into them, mm. um, and right at the front of the book, I haven't seen this happen often. You have uh, the the list of the characters with their traits, basically um, a very basic uh, age, alias, uh, mental health, uh, pronouns, I think, and a couple of other things. Mm. Um, why, why did you do that? So that really was my editor's idea. Like I had done that for myself, um, just in my notes, so I could keep track of my characters. And then my editor, Stevlin, she suggested, why don't you just put it up front? So basically, right at the front of the book, there is the character's name, age, location, vice or mental illness, their star sign, um, like a, a couple of other things. So you know who, and their nicknames as well. You know who they are kind of up front and you can refer back to it. Um, and... It, I think because I did that, the, the character cards, other things just came from it because I had done that up front. And so um, I think it does make it a bit, it made it, it really just made it easier for me to navigate. So I could remember this is what these characters are about. This is how old Isaac is. So when I write a scene when he's like younger, 10 years ago, I get the dates right and I don't end up having like this two year old drinking a brandy. So it helped me keep track of like, you know, chronologically and shit like that. And um, and making it like putting it as part of the packaging was really something that that came after as a result of like my editor's vision. Okay, uh, that, it was actually also like very interesting and cool because it, it set up immediately where things were going. And I ha also had something to refer back to if I ever got confused. I'm terrible with numbers. I I, I frequently just like just skim past it. So when you had a date and I was like, wait, what's happening now? Why? And I had to go back and say oh, this is back in time. What have I done? Why am I a terrible reader? I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm also a terrible reader. It's fine. That's why they're only there in the front. <laughs> um, and in fact, you've actually like brought uh, um, some of your material, of like how you wrote this, this, this book. Is this the thing? It's this big black book. Um, oh, I should not do that with a mic. Okay, fine. So yeah, it's, it's all kind of in here. I just... I just ended up having to have everything um, written down, like this is huge ass mind map. Um, there's also like a post-it note that I wrote to myself, which is everyone's puss, and then full stop, and then another sentence, insulate. And so that really was the spirit in which I embarked in writing the book. Um, what does insulate mean? Insulate, well, for me, it just meant like insulate myself from everything else, from my job, from people's feedback. I didn't really tell anyone really that I was writing a book, barring a handful of people. No one knew I was doing it. So... Um, writing it was a very insular process. I didn't, I wasn't showing people drafts. I wasn't discussing it with people because I get derailed by feedback really, really easily. So I wrote from like a space that was just mine. Um, so every time I opened this to kind of work on the book, I would be reminded, insulate and everyone's puss. And that really helped me get into the right frame of mind. Is there um, uh, in a sense that writing is kind of traumatic as well, especially when you're writing it? Yeah, yeah, mm. I think it can be. I think there's a lot of re-traumatization for me that happened anyway in writing it. There's a large part, the part that was um, cathartic, but also looking at passages that are traumatic, there's like a re-traumatization that happens there. So I saved a lot and listened to really loud trap music. And that was a very big part of my writing process, which I did in the evenings while I wasn't working. So um, yeah, I think it does. It does. It can be, but it can also be therapeutic, I guess. Yeah, sometimes, you know, you have to go through to get to the other side of it, I guess. For sure. Um, For sure. Also, there's like a great musicality to like, some, especially to some chapters. I'm remembering the, 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 the chapter, um, it's that kind of night. What's the thing? It's that kind of feel. 
Hmm. Every every which every paragraph ends with the same kind of with the same rhythmic. Oh yeah, so it's yeah. like an opening and a closing to each chapter that has like a theme. Like there's the mm. first chapter is about of the, it's oblivion, and the second chapter is trash, and mm. then there's one that centers devotion and love. Um, musically speaking, like I was kind of influenced a bit by Kendrick Lamar's "Damn." How each of his songs kind of has this um, this pride and lust, and I mean everybody should know. Kendrick Lamar's damn, right, surely, yeah. So, I mean, each each, par- each chapter also kind of looks at a theme. Like, there's one, the last chapter, I think, is legacy and power. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, they, you know, each chapter has this this theme running through it that does speak to some kind of, like, you know, human emotion. Except for Chice. Chice is not a human emotion. But, I mean, I could also argue that Chice is a human emotion. What is Chice? Chice is... Um, Look at me like I don't... I, I don't know. I'm sorry. <laughs> How do you not know Don't that? shame me Chice, for, like, my no, ignorance. Okay. I won't... I won't Otherwise, I will never express it. That's true. Okay, so Chice, Chice means to romantically pursue somebody for oh, the yeah, white readers and for the white listeners out there. It just... It's to, <laughs> to pursue someone. Like, you can chase someone by sliding into the DMs, or mm. you can chase someone, like, in the old school way by asking someone out. Um, there are many different ways to chase, but it's, it's yeah, to pursue... Um, yeah, to smack okay. it down. Makes perfect sense. <laughs> <laughs> um, was there any kind of pressure from an editorial side to uh, make things, uh, make language like more accessible to like mainstream mm-hmm. English literary uh, readers? Not really. Okay. Um, the one thing my editor did uh, say is, and she gave me the option was to take the cups in it and make and and kind of have a uniformity between that cups and and like the other the other books published by Quella that are also in cups. For example, Chase Reese's Kinnis. Everybody go read Chase Reese's Kinnis. It's incredible. It's cuck funny. I died. Um, and like there, the spelling the, the spelling is is important. So do you spell Kint, um, K-I-N or K-I-N-D-T? Or, you know, etc. There's like a thousand such examples. Mm. So Stevlin did recommend that we do go for uniformity and create like stylistically a uniformity of cups. So that was something that I looked at, like the, the spelling of Sturvy. I think I initially had it S-T-U-R-V-Y and the U was then changed to an I. Um, so and she also said, if you don't want to change it, we don't have to. But I also I like the idea of there being kind of you know, uniformity of it for the publisher because it does mean that we are starting to standardize it as a language, which I think is tricky, but I like the idea of, of, of seeing more of it. So that was a consideration, but I wasn't told to dial back on the cups. I wasn't told to like, um, you know, silence it at all, which was, um, which obviously speaks to how incredible my editorial team is. Yeah. So, you know, I saw you post on social media a little bit about, like, uh, the pursuit of getting this published, uh, you know, some responses mm-hmm. and rejections and things. Um, but it sounds like at the end of it, you found the right team. What was the what was the, mm-hmm. that journey like? It was cuck. Like, when I, when I wrote this, when I um, submitted the manuscript or, you know, when Stevlin and when they came into the picture, I had kind of given up on, on submitting completely. Like I, I had tried to submit to publishers before and um, gotten many rejection emails. Unfortunately, we cannot. There's just two, whatever. They were, you know, there were just various reasons given. And I think after a while, I just stopped completely. I was like, this is, I'm not going to write another novel. I'm not going to write fiction. This is not something I'm, t-. I stopped trying to do it. And so, there was kind of a liberation in not trying anymore because the stakes just become lower for you. Um, and so, you know, I hadn't been pursuing that, that, that kind of literary career option for years. Um, and then when Stevlin emailed me asking if, like, you know, cause she had heard me read at, at an open book festival on a short story that I had written, and then she approached me and she was like, you know, do you have something to submit? I was, it was, like, kind of exciting. I couldn't believe it. I was also just in disbelief. I was like, are you... Just like I've been trying to do this for years now. You're going to be like, do I have long form? And I was like, yes, of course. And I didn't. And I had to write a novel. And then I was like, fuck, I have to write a novel now, actually. And that was quite daunting. Um, but yeah, I mean, the short answer to that long ramble is like I had given up when I got approached by them. Okay. Well, I'm really glad that it that happened. This is a really, really good book. Um, it's very awesome. So. Thank you. Yeah. I don't, want, I don't want to embarrass you in front of like the cameras. I'm like, like, but it's very, very good. Thanks. Um, sorry, I would get like. Oh. I'm gonna hold my cards. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, 
Uh, before we do that, I just want to make sure that we have it. Uh, where can people uh, find you? Where can people find the book? So you can find the book um, at most retailers, so exclusive books, the book lounge. Um, it's available at, at most of them. If it isn't um, and they're out of stock, please just like say so and then they'll get more. Otherwise, you can also get it from um, my author store, mermaidfillet.com. Um, and if you do it that way, I will sign it and get it delivered to you personally. Um, and then, yeah, you can find all these links on um, social media at, um, at Mermaid Fillet on Instagram, at Mermaid underscore Fillet on Twitter. And there's a Facebook page as well. Oh, one more thing. Can I find out your favorite character? My favorite character? Yes. Oh, Pat. Oh, no way! Yeah, I was like, I really like feel like that, that, that vibe of just... Like what? Like what he feels about the world. It's like, oh man, I, I feel like that. I felt like that a lot. Hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. clearly I can't read my cards for <laughs> shit. <laughs> for context, read the book. For context, read the book. No, no, I mean, like also, like I did, like I like there are like things in all of the characters that are just so like well observed that I, I can see in myself and I can see in like the people around me. Um, you know. Uh, and it's just it's just like a, like very 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 authentic um and i guess that was like kind of my final question is um is it, right now there's like a big movement towards like own voices you've mm -hmm. written a book that's like in copsa it's like um dealing with um issues of mental health feminism and all that stuff um how do people write authentically hmm I'm not sure how to answer question, that. That's a big question. Yeah, so it's a question. I suppose you need to, which is a difficult thing to do right now, um, in in like a social media age. You need to not curate yourself, and I think that that's a tough thing to do um, because when creating anything, I think whether it's like writing or whether it's a painting, you there's some part of your mind that's always thinking of the audience and who's going to see it and how's it going to be received. I think you need to write without doing that. And one thing that did help me was realizing there is an editorial process. So if, you know, if it's too much or it's too raw, it's too cuck, like it can be edited out. But I think that first draft has to be uncurated and you have to have faith in, in, in that uncurated process. Um, so like move from a place of curiosity rather than a place of marketability. Um, and that might be fucking terrible advice, but that, that's how I think you, you do it. Yeah, like the post it says, insulate. Insulate. Awesome. It's great. This has been um, Zania for Games and Geekery. I've been chatting with Mia Ardern. Mia, thank you so much. Thank you, John. <laughs> and then, like, it's like the moment we like hold on for a while, and we're like, like Mikhail's gonna press like the stop button any moment now. Yeah.